We return to the Gospel of Matthew in the fifth chapter. We hear these words from Jesus. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. In the fall of 2015, just before his second birthday, our son Samuel began at a brand new school. In fact, he was the very first student enrolled in this new school. The teacher is the cousin of a dear friend of ours who had moved to Decatur, Georgia with the vision of opening a play-based preschool in her home. And so, with Sam enrolled and Jen ready to teach, Jen's House Preschool began. Over the three years that Sam spent at this extraordinary place, we watched him grow in knowledge, in confidence, and in compassion. And in that time, Jen became a teacher and a friend to our whole family. One example should do, sometimes on Friday afternoons, I would ride my bike down the hill to pick Samuel up and, and bring him home from school. One, one Friday afternoon, I think Samuel was almost four years old, and we were riding home, and our conversation was, was all about numbers. From behind me on the bike, Sam shouted, Dad, I know what the biggest number is. It's a million billion zillion. I decided to correct him, but also to be deliberatively provocative and perhaps a little bit annoying. Smiling, I said, no, actually, son, that's not true. I know an even bigger number, infinity. Without missing a beat, Sam shouted from behind me, that's not right, Dad. Infinity is not a number. It's an idea. <laughs> How did you know that? Jen taught me that, and she knows everything <laughs> since she's a teacher. Humbled, I had to agree with Sam and with Jen. Okay, teachers may not literally know everything, but how many of us could relate a similar experience? I used to think, but, but the teacher says, teachers are these extraordinary human beings who, who open our minds to transformative discoveries, who, who bring to our hearts previously unimagined realities, new ways of seeing and understanding the world and our lives in it. 
Each of us can remember the names of teachers who have had that kind of impact on our lives. I will be forever grateful for Ms. George, the speech and debate teacher at Southeast Guilford High School who, who believed in my speaking abilities more than I did and helped me discover a passion that has become central to my vocation. In the New Testament and throughout the centuries of Christian life, Jesus has been called by many names. He's been given many titles. But it's fair to say that among his earliest followers, the most common title was teacher, rabbi. As we continue to meet Jesus again at second, we do well, I think, to return to this, this basic title that was core to his identity. Jesus was a teacher. He taught in stories and parables. He instructed through examples and deeds. He used direct commands and, and provocative questions. Even the gospel narratives that center on miracles or healing stories are applied as lessons for those who are his disciples, disciples, even the name happens to be the Greek word for students. Like all master teachers, Jesus drew from the, the well of wisdom that was the past, the tradition in which he was raised. But, but also, like all great teachers, Jesus challenged his listeners with imaginative, demanding reinterpretations of previously accepted truths. And nowhere is this clearer than in the most well-known of Jesus' teachings, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. It takes up all of Matthew's 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters. The Sermon on the Mount, even, even the location, is meant to evoke the example of another of Scripture's greatest teachers, Moses who climbed and then descended the summit of Sinai with lessons for God's people to follow. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus too is a teacher. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus too climbs a mountain and, and begins to offer instruction to those around him. But this sermon is really a seminar the audience is not general, but, but, but really quite specific. Jesus here addresses his disciples. Those who, like him, are well-versed in the laws of Moses, in the teachings of the Torah. He addresses his students directly. He begins by affirming the tradition in which they all stand. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the commandments. In fact, I have come to fulfill them all. But then he signals a shift. Lifting up familiar commands of Hebrew Scripture readily accepted by his audience, you have heard that it was said, he immediately intensifies those commands but I say to you, we used to think, but the teacher says, yes, Jesus was a teacher, and his lessons here are clear. They're bold. They're challenging. You heard them. He, he instructs his students to turn from all acts of vengeance, to give without judgment or concern, and to love the ones they would call enemy. Here I can imagine some bewildered looks on the faces of Jesus' followers. <laughs> the teacher has gone too far. How can anyone obey these commands? And it's, it's at just that moment, as if the rest is not enough, that he, he chooses to close this section of instructions with the command, be perfect, 
just as God is perfect. Now, we may be tempted, and many interpreters of this passage have been, to read these commands as a kind of intentional hyperbole, meant to provide not literal instruction, but some some metaphorical guidelines. Or we may want to dismiss the commands because they are from another era, an era when it was okay for Jesus' followers to be weak and submissive. These kinds of reactions, these kinds of interpretations may give comfort to those of us who feel inadequate to such high standards, but I must confess they don't account for the seriousness or the repetition of these lessons. I've found that whenever the instructions of Jesus feel uncomfortable or daunting, we should not explain them away. Better to take the teacher at his word, to be students who try our best to listen. Yes, followers of Jesus are called to be lifelong learners. We must never claim to have it all figured out, to be all finished with our lessons. There is no graduation from the school of gospel living. We will never be the teacher. We are students. At second, we want to be serious about spiritual growth, about the importance of of learning together. As I shared earlier this morning, in the month of February, we'll be offering Saturday evening sessions on Scripture, part of our, our effort to deepen our understanding and broaden our perspective on the Word of God. Jesus was a teacher. And the central focus of his teaching and preaching was the kingdom of God. These radical redefinitions of ancient commandments were were part of a larger picture he was painting. It is a picture of what will be. A picture of what should be picture of what can be. It can be because Jesus was not simply describing something that exists out there. These were not object lessons. His teaching was not meant to offer us more information or knowledge, not to make us smarter or more intellectual in our faith. No, Jesus embodied and taught a way of life a path to transformation, love for all, strength through service, gaining by giving. We we followers of Jesus are not simply called to understand the importance of these values. We We are not called to simply listen closely or nod in agreement. That sounds like a good idea, Jesus. No, we have the awesome responsibility of demonstrating in our individual and communal life, the reality that God's kingdom is already among us. And that kingdom comes among us when we who follow Jesus put into practice the lessons we've learned. If you and I believe that what Jesus teaches us is the truth, And we must live as if it is true. We must resist all that that stands in the way of this kingdom. And I think that begins with our own cynicism, with our hard-heartedness. What if we allow the teachings of Jesus to challenge our assumptions, and accepted truths. For we have heard it said that self-centeredness and and endless acquisition and unchecked greed are acceptable. After all, we live in a world of scarcity and competition. 
But the teacher says that God's kingdom is a place of abundance, and that abundance is freely shared. Neighbors are never left to suffer in the ditch in God's kingdom. We have heard it said that, that there is nothing that we can do about intractable sins of generations past or, or big systems outside our control or, or suffering that is beyond our comprehension, but the teacher says that we are accountable for the work of God that is set before us. To use the power we have in the service of others, we are called to the dogged hope that inspires perseverance. We have heard it said, and we hear it said often, that those who disagree with us, those whose path is different from ours, are to be avoided, or othered, or feared, or judged. But the teacher says that humility is the mark of discipleship. That the grace of God is wider than our restricted vision, deeper than our limited understanding. We have heard it said that we simply must accept the inhumanity of others as inevitable, that, that the absolute division of people into warring factions and the total loss of common ground on which to stand is simply a part of the lived reality, and we might as well get used to it, but the teacher says that even those we call enemy are beloved. that our love for them is an essential step in our growth as His followers. Whew. So what does it look like to love your enemies in this moment, in this time? Well, we might begin by identifying who those enemies are. We tend to think of enemies in those same hyperbolic terms that we ascribe to Jesus' teachings. We, we tend to concentrate our attention on distant, well-known figures or, or perhaps those who personify all that we detest. But perhaps we do well to start a little more modestly. It was 70 years ago that C.S. Lewis suggested if you're going to start taking up the practice of forgiveness, we had better start with something easier than the Gestapo. Lewis suggested a spouse or a co-worker. In the same way, I think loving our enemies might be a lesson we learn best by practicing. Maybe start very close. Last week, a friend gave me a new book by Adam Grant. He's a professor of organizational psychology at the Wharton School. The, the provocative title is Think Again, The Power of Knowing What We Don't Know. The title of the first chapter certainly caught my eye. I think you'll know why. The title is A Preacher, a Prosecutor, a Politician, and a Scientist Walk Into Your Mind. I'm disappointed to report that there's no punchline for a good laugh. Instead, Grant recommends that we think again about how we relate to our thoughts, our ideas, our perspectives, and especially the people who challenge our beliefs or, or threaten our assumptions. He offers practical advice as a kind of road map for, I would say, loving our enemies. The term is not too strong, I think. The ones that are right in front of us. It begins, he writes, with listening, or in his words, increase your question to statement ratio. Even though I'm a preacher, I'm going to try to do that. 
must also acknowledge this morning that loving our enemies, our, our adversaries, our opponents, especially those who have harmed or hurt us, is really hard work. Jesus is a challenging teacher. It helps me to remember that we do not love our enemies because they have done anything to deserve our love. We love them simply because they too are created in the image of a loving God. It helps me to remember that we do not love our enemies because we hope it will change them, but because the simple act of choosing love changes us. I'm reminded of one of my favorite lessons. To withhold forgiveness is like drinking rat poison and expecting the rat to die. My friends, what if in this time, time of palpable tension, battle lines clearly drawn, we who follow Jesus adopted the posture not of soldiers but of students? What if we asked ourselves how God might be teaching us in each encounter and every conversation? Could we, could we model a different way? A way that our teacher insists will lead to more impact and change for our neighbors in need, more dignity and justice for those denied them, more safety and peace for all God's children. Could we, could we maybe gather some, some unlikely partners, even enemies, in service of the common good? I'm more than eager to give it a try if you're willing in our church, in our city, in our state. After all, you're here today because Jesus is your teacher. And our teacher has told us to love our enemies. We must love our enemies. Our teacher insists that this radical, peculiar action offers a pathway to the kingdom of God. Our teacher instructs us to live differently in a world hell-bent on following the destructive path of retribution, to leave it behind. My friends, now is no time for us to abandon this central call of the gospel in favor of the, the short-lived satisfaction of striking out, hunkering down, or shrinking back. No, the world, the world, the world is begging us to be the church of Jesus Christ And I believe that God has placed within us the grace to meet this moment with faithful resolve, compassionate speech, and tangible action. Jesus, open our hearts and our minds. Jesus, teach us to listen, to speak, to live as your disciples. Amen.